So before talking about the pathophysiology of sickle cell anemia, let's just take a look at three red blood cells. Uh, starting with one all the way here on the left. So this is a red blood cell that would be found uh, in a healthy adult. All right? If we look inside it, there are thousands of oxygen-carrying molecules called hemoglobin. All right? And if we took a look at a single one of these, what we would see is this. We would see four subunits, two alpha subunits, and two beta subunits. All right, so two alphas and two betas. And this is a particular type of hemoglobin. It's the predominant form in healthy individuals. It's called hemoglobin type A. All right, we can take a look at a single one of these subunits. So we can look even closer at a single subunit and see what it is made up of. All right, so here's a single subunit, the beta one in this particular case, and each one of these subunits is made up of a heme group, which is where oxygen binds uh, in hemoglobin, and it's made up of a protein called globin. All right, in this particular case, it's a beta globin because we're making the beta subunit. If we were looking at an alpha subunit, it would be alpha globin, and it would still have the heme group. All right, so this is one type of hemoglobin, hemoglobin type A. All right, uh, there are other types. So, for instance, during gestation and in early childhood, we have this red blood cell. All right, and it expresses a different type of hemoglobin. So, if we take a look at this hemoglobin, it also has four parts. It has two alpha subunits, but instead of betas, it has two gamma subunits. All right, so it has two alpha and two gamma subunits, and this particular type of uh, hemoglobin is called hemoglobin type F, F for fetal. All right, and again, we can take a closer look at each one of these subunits, and what we would see is a heme group again. It has to have a heme group if it's going to bind oxygen. Um, and it also has the globin protein. In this case, it's a different type. It's a gamma globin. All right. And then finally, if we take a look at this red blood cell all the way on the right, so this is the red blood cell that would be found in an individual with sickle cell anemia or sickle cell disease. All right. It also has thousands and thousands of these hemoglobin molecules. All right. But they're different, and that makes all the that makes all the difference. So. This hemoglobin molecule is made up of two alpha subunits, just like the other ones, but it has beta S subunits, two beta S subunits, all right? So two alpha and two beta S subunits. And it has a particular name, it's called hemoglobin type S, all right? And you guessed it. So that S comes from the, from the word sickle. All right, and so we can also take a closer look at each one of these subunits, and just like in the other cases, uh, we would see a heme group, the oxygen-carrying group, and we'd see a protein called globin again, uh, but this type of globin is different. It's a beta S globin. All right, so if you look at these pictures right here, these two different hemoglobin molecules, hemoglobin type A found in healthy individuals, and hemoglobin type S found in individuals with uh, sickle cell anemia. The only difference between these two types of hemoglobins are the globin proteins that make up the beta subunits. So beta versus beta S. So the question becomes now, what is it? How are these globin proteins different? Uh, why are they different? And to answer that question, we have to look even closer. We have to look at the DNA, the blueprint, uh, for the for the protein. So here, let's start with our uh, hemoglobin type A found in healthy individuals. So if we look at the DNA here, we would see a sequence that reads something like this. I'm not writing out the whole entire sequence, just a segment uh, to make the point. So here's the complementary strand. All right, if we translate this DNA, we get our globin beta protein, okay, and it's got amino acids, um, and then this particular sequence right here codes for an amino acid 
called glutamate. All right, it's the sixth amino acid in the in in the whole entire chain. All right, so this is the globin, um, the globin protein, and we said that if we combine this globin protein with the heme group that carries oxygen, we get our beta subunit, uh, which ultimately builds up the hemoglobin type A uh, molecule. All right. So in sickle cell anemia, what happens is we have a mutation in a single nucleotide, all right, and that's called a point mutation because we're mutating at a single, uh, at a single point. So now the sequence reads something else. Right, it might read something like this. Here's the complementary strand. And when we translate this DNA sequence, all right, so we have all these other amino acids that we don't care about. But when we get to this particular sequence that's now different as a result of the change, there's a different amino acid that's being coded for. And that's called valine. All right. In the same position as glutamate, but totally different, with different properties. Okay, so this is now globin, uh, the beta S globin protein. All right, and again, if we combine this with a heme group, um, we get our beta S subunit, and then when we build up these subunits, we get our hemoglobin molecule, um, and in this case, this is hemoglobin type S, type S because of the subunit, all right? So the only difference, the only difference between hemoglobin type A and hemoglobin type S is that single amino acid in the sixth position uh, that's a result of a point mutation. So the question now is, what's the big deal? Why does it matter? How does hemoglobin type S uh, contribute to the disease process? Well, hemoglobin type S when it's deoxygenate, when it drops off oxygen in tissues, um, it tends to polymerize. It tends to form these long polymers, these long needle-like um, structures. And these long structures distort the shape of the red blood cell and cause it to adopt a sickle shape. And that's where the name comes from. All right, so this is the red blood cell now. Um, the good news is that this process is reversible. So if we add on the oxygen again, when the hemoglobin picks up the oxygen, it reverts back to its normal shape. Um, and so the things that cause the deoxygenation, that cause hemoglobin to become deoxygenated are things like hypoxia, um, just to name a few uh, things it's like acidosis and uh, dehydration. All right. Okay, so having this property of, uh, of, of sickling um, does two things. One, it makes the red blood cell mechanically fragile. Right? And if it's mechanically fragile, it tends to, uh, to be destroyed inside the blood vessels, and that's called intravascular hemolysis. So destruction of red blood cells inside the blood vessels is called intravascular hemolysis. And this uh, leads to anemia because you have less circulating red blood cells. Um, the other thing uh, that happens when this uh, red blood cell sickles, after a few cycles, uh, it becomes rigid. It becomes rigid and becomes permanently sickled. And that does two things. It causes extravascular hemolysis. It causes these red blood cells to be destroyed in the, uh, in the spleen where they're filtered. So that's why it's extravascular because it's outside the blood vessels. And that also causes anemia. Anemia is the hallmark uh, symptom of the disease. But the rigid and sickled um, red blood cells also cause occlusion, occlusion of blood vessels, and that causes ischemia which is responsible for many of the acute uh, symptoms of the disease.